That was the first movement of City Rama, a piece of visual music inspired by one particular building in the City of London. This is it, the cheese grater. The unexpected realisation that this building possessed the qualities of music came when I visited the building a few years ago before it was finished. The architects had not set out to produce a building with a musical agenda, but it had happened anyway in a structure that generated its own harmony, pattern, discord, repetition and silence. My piece, City Rama, is in three movements, and each movement, each in its own way, throws some light on what it is that makes a building musical, a quality that can be sensed in just a few buildings. It's just possible, I think, that this slim heritage holds the key to making our cities more sentient, more able to respond to the ever-changing physical and emotional needs of the people they serve. As I say, it's rare to find the disciplines of architecture and music melded together in a synchronicity of sound and space. From my start point in the City of London, I'm now going to retrace a path that I've trodden throughout Europe to find those few examples where I've experienced the tensions of music in the spaces of architecture. Daniel Liebskind, unlike the architects of the cheese grater, intended from the very beginning that his Jewish museum in Berlin should conform to a musical agenda. Its geometry produces not only a zigzag expression of the museum's musical score externally, but also a similar experience internally. The museum's spaces elicit a strong emotional response from visitors, which exemplifies Liebskin's belief that the way architecture is produced and received can be very similar to music, a fact that is less surprising when you know that before becoming an architect, he himself was a performing musician. Liebskind had practiced long and hard to achieve his success in Berlin. The building was 13 years in the making. He'd based his design on a series of chamber works, collections of kaleidoscopic lines and symbols that represented the structure of sound. They were not fantasy projects, but more architectural explorations. And you can sense that Liebskin's chamber works are musical, even though there's no evidence of musical notation. As he says, they're scores through which I orchestrate present commissions. A point made evident when you see the patterns of his chamber works inscribed on the elevations of the museum. Returning to City Rama for the moment, my aim in the first movement was to demonstrate the underlying patterns that were endemic to the design of the cheese grate. First, I identified the building's light motives, as I called them. You're seeing them here. Sometimes they were small details, at other times they were whole elevations or complete spaces. Then I devised a set of repeat patterns, all derived from my light motives, which were projected onto the slanting facade of the cheese grater. You saw that happen when I performed the first movement of City Rama. It was my way of uncovering and making explicit the building's musicality. I regard these patterns as being the equivalent of the notes and symbols used by composers to ensure that performances of their music affect listeners at an emotional level. After all, this is a composer's reason for putting notes on paper in the first place. Buildings, however, occupy a non-musical world of objects, concepts and desires. And for this reason, it's rare to find a building with a preconceived musical agenda. I'll perform now the second movement of City Rama.
You saw there a series of reverse explosions as fragmented components of the cheese grater's light motives gradually came together or spun apart to reveal the architectural elements from which they were derived. Composer, architect and engineer Yanis Zanakis had a similar idea when he saw his music as multicoloured fireworks of sound, in which each point of light appears and instantaneously disappears against a dark sky. He wrote music based on glissandi, sonic spaces of continuous evolution, as he called them, produced by dragging the bow across the strings of a violin or cello. It was a visual representation of glissandi that underpinned his design for the Philips Pavilion at the 1958 Brussels World's Fair. His aim was to create a space where music and architecture could be bound together in intimate connection. Since my visit there as an architectural student, my memory may have faded, but I still have an awareness of what it was like to be inside Xenarchus's hyperbolic conoids, to experience a poem electronique devised by Le Corbusier and Edgar Vorez. It's an experience that can never be repeated, but it did provide for me some sort of measure by which the musicality or otherwise of a building could be measured. In 1958, my journey didn't end at the Brussels World's Fair. It continued to the steps of the Parthenon. Many before me have felt the pull of this ancient Greek temple. Le Corbusier found at the Acropolis a work that rings within us in time, with a universe whose laws we obey. The Parthenon didn't happen overnight. It's the apogee of a long process of development and constant refinement, which, to quote Le Corbusier, can make people serene or gay, as can music. I can confirm that all those years ago, my own visit didn't disappoint. Sitting on the steps with Richard Rogers and Paul Korolek, watching the sun go down, was a life-changing experience. The pentelic marble cast its magic spell. In retrospect, I can see the inevitability of Richard Rogers' cheese grater becoming the cause of my current vicarious journey through space and time. As an expression of the universality of the Golden Section, the Parthenon, more than any other building, has influenced the course of Western architecture ever since. More than any other Doric temple, it represented the apotheosis of mathematical discoveries and deductions that had taken place just one century earlier at the Pythagorean school in South Italy, a story that begins to explain the Parthenon's musicality. It was Pythagoras who picked out from the repeated hitting of a blacksmith's hammers on an anvil, sound vibrations or notes that were pleasing to the ear, intervals that were very similar to those derived from the Fibonacci series. As it happens, the same sequences define the proportional principles of the golden section. A discovery attributed to Theano, wife of Pythagoras, who after her husband's death ran the Pythagorean school in the late 6th century BC. It's an extraordinary fact, therefore, that it was the Pythagoreans, husband and wife, who established indelible links between the proportions of architecture and the tensions of music that ever since have remained viable and immutable. Time tensions are produced too in music by setting up clear fixed points by which time is measured. Such regular tensions create the rhythm of a piece. As ever, the ancient Greeks had a word for it, rhythmos, movement, fluctuation or variation marked by the regular recurrence of natural flow of related elements. The third movement of City Rama exemplifies this idea. <laughs>
through rhythm that architecture can begin to speak the language of music and by this means evoke an emotional response from its audience. In architecture, the notation of rhythm is achieved through geometry, which explains why, after his 1911 epiphany on the Acropolis, Le Corbusier dedicated himself to finding a method for fixing the fundamental geometry underlying art and architecture. His appreciation of the Pythagorean definition of harmony, achieved by numbers, led eventually to his own Le Modulor, which provided a harmonic set of human scale measures as an assurance against capriciousness. He regarded his Le Modulor, based on the golden section, as a tool of linear or optical measures similar to a musical script. Soon after the Second World War, Le Corbusier had a chance to test the tenets of Le Mondulor on a real building, the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille. Here, the architect was able to put into practice his ideas for a vertical garden city by supporting the structure on massive piloti to allow for circulation and gathering space flowing through at ground level. And designed like a huge liner, Unité d'Habitation pulses with rhythms derived from Le Modulor's remarkable resources of numbers. So what can be learnt from these memories of past journeys? I think we can see more clearly what Liebskin means when he says that architecture is a world of relationships that is very, very close to his experience as a performing musician. His Jewish museum creates the conditions necessary for the arousal of effect. The spaces have meaning precisely because they are uncomfortable and seemingly unfinished. Visitors are continually surprised by the feelings of discomfort they experience. This element of surprise is what keeps us listening to music. Leonard Mayer puts forward the idea that emotion or effect is aroused when a listener's tendency to respond is arrested or inhibited. In everyday life, the tensions created by the inhibition of tendencies often go unresolved. They are meaningless and accidental. But in music, the inhibition of a tendency becomes meaningful because the relationship between the tendency and its necessary resolution is made explicit and apparent. I'll play an example. You heard there a structural gap in the music, producing a hiatus a surprise tension. It aroused the keenest expectation because you didn't know how completion would be accomplished. Now for another example. That was the well-known opening to Sergei Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf. Compared with the melodic intervals in the first two bars, the intervals in the third bar are strikingly improbable. They sound wrong. But Prokofiev immediately repeats the wrong note sequence to confirm that he meant it. A surprise is produced because the wrong notes are not those that the listener might have been led to expect. As Harrison Birtwistle explains, it's the listener's recognition of countless moments of surprise that enables music to cast its spell. The way a composer chooses to engineer his or her surprises is what produces the individual sounds and rhythms by which we instantly recognise and react to a piece of music. The same too with architecture, although normally this stops short of instilling feelings and responsiveness in our buildings. But it can be done, as I've shown, so my contention is that it should be possible to apply the lessons of music more widely to our built environments. 
I'm given some hope in this endeavour by recent progress into the mysteries of how we see and how we hear. That is, the science of auditory and visual scene analysis. Neuroscientists are beginning to make some headway in understanding how the myriad of sights and sounds processed by the human brain can succeed in conjuring up an impression of a piece of music or a work of architecture. It's an extraordinarily complex process. Although I wasn't consciously aware of the fact, my own brain accomplished such a task when I unraveled the cheese grater's light motives. The visual input to my brain would have been highly complex and dynamic, changing with each fixation as I moved my eyes from one aspect of the cheese grater to another. It was the entry of these glimpses or snapshots into my brain's short-term memory combined with the automatic activation of visual matches in my long-term memory that enabled me to produce the images I've called light motives. All this happened in my brain's global conscious workspace. It's by means of this global workspace that conscious contents appear to be dis disseminated globally to the great multitude of cells that are unconscious. The result is a consciousness network with massive connectivity, which accounts for the fact that in our efforts to understand the world, every auditory signal has a visual counterpart and vice versa. It's by this means that architecture and music are fused inevitably together. As science reveals, the links between the two art forms are not only mathematical, but also biological. Our brains are wired that way. It has taken a vicarious journey through time and space for me to make connections, which somewhat to my surprise, reveal that my own predilections for experiencing architecture and music are not entirely quixotic, but can now be established as scientific fact. Given some confidence by this discovery, I'm now concluding my travels by returning to a specific urban environment which is close to home. At the Barbican, in the City of London, opportunities to communicate emotionally have been given equal billing alongside ambitions to satisfy aesthetic and intellectual criteria. The architects Chamberlain, Powell and Bond were not musicians as far as I know, but they have still revealed a composer's instinct by taking obsessive account of the expectations that is, the tendencies to respond of the Barbican's inhabitants. It's one of the very few large estates throughout the world that reflect Le Corbusier's vision of the vertical garden city, and what's more, a proportional system based on the module. Overall, the Barbican is an exemplar of architecture as performance art, which unwinds to the eye and ear along pedestrian high walks revealing unexpected vistas amid the sounds of fountains, a paradigm for our future cities, no less. No wonder that late in life, I've taken my own stride towards this rare example of a sentient city. <laughs>